I think they're maybe racist just because I'm even they don't want my help. It seems it doesn't really matter if your superpowers fire to the mouth. Oh, you son of a bitch, crap. <laughs> All right. Well, whatever. We have the, the other one. So, welcome to the comic show. I'm leaving that all in. Our robot is being sucky again, but we're going to power through. I'm Lou Gonzalez. I'm joined by, joined by the the Wonder Johns, John Seiler, and John Scott. Man. Oh, is that man. yes? Man, what a brave new world we live in now. Oh, that show got canceled, though. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Uh, brave new world? No. You know that was. That- Brave New World, written by Grant Morrison. Pe- wow. on, on, on the most famous streaming service of all time, Peacock. What? Yes. They turned Brave New World into a show on Peacock. And it was being written by Grant Morrison, which, thank you for the great segue, John Seiler. Um, got and it got cancelled after its first season, which is why he was doing the interview where he came out, well, I don't know if came out, where he discussed that he is non-binary. That's why that interview happened. Yeah, which, uh, I don't know, man. It makes a lot of sense when you consider oh, like, yeah. a lot of the stuff he's written. My girlfriend saw that show, like, over like, the first couple episodes, because apparently with, like, TV shows on Peacock, you can only see, like, the first few episodes before they're like, hey, pay for premium. But even they, she was like, yeah, this wasn't that good. Oh, and, this yeah. is, and this is based off of a Grant Morrison book? No, this is based off, like, the one of the most famous dystopian future novels of all time. Oh. He was writing the show. Oh. Yes. He was one of the head writers on the show. Like, next to, like, next to 1984, it's this in 1984 in terms of, like, really famous um, dystopian future novels. Uh, I mean, good for him for getting that uh, Peacock yeah. money. It's a 1932 also, novel. Yeah. Also, you say, like, the famous, famous app Peacock, when it's like, look, man, if we're gonna, like, Dunk like, on apps like I, I, it's not as bad of a dunk as what Quibi was. I mean, well, okay, it's like the second, like next, to, like I'm just saying, Peacock doesn't really have that many shows right now. No. I need, they're behind it just, it people. also just started. It's what, like three months old. Does like, Peacock have like fresh well, Peacock Prince is Bel-Air? yeah, it's NBC, it's universe, so it has it's NBC Universal, it's owned by Comcast, so it has every Universal monster movie on there. It has all of NBC's entire backlog is on there. Um, the big thing, the only reason, the only thing I've watched on Peacock was the second Psych movie. Okay, that I do want to watch because I want to watch that and I want to watch Ballast on Galactica for the first time. Yeah. Oh, and that movie is really good. Um, Wait, and makes an appearance of our last movie that we just saw. Buffy makes an appearance because she was in Psych. Oh, I thought you said Psycho 2, and I'm like, No, oh. no, Psych, you know. Oh. <laughs> uh, I never saw Psych. I saw, I would always see ads for Psych during Raw. Psych is so good. Like, it's, Psych yeah. and Monk in Suits, just like yeah. a whole bunch of, like, hour-long well, okay, USA but, shows. Well, like, well, suits, suits is a drama. Monk and Psych are comedy procedurals. Monk, I think, is, like, for an older person, where Psych is definitely geared towards, like, a 30, 40-something-ish. Uh, I, I think the younger crowd could dig Monk as well. I don't know when I was a kid, it, I didn't. That's just me. Maybe I was weird. It, it also came out, like, way earlier than Psych. Like, it yeah. was in its, like, last couple seasons when no, Psych started. The, at the time, the last episode of Psych, they kind of referenced Monk a little bit. Yes, they're in the same universe. They're yeah. in the, US, the USA universe. U.S. USA universe. Yeah, which you should also note, Siler, that John Cena plays the main uh, female lead's brother. Oh. Who, who's also like a secret CIA operative, Psych. and their father is uh, William Shatner. Psych had, I think, the craziest guest star list I've ever oh, seen. It's insane. Because yeah. he had, uh, du- oh my God, I always fuck up his name. Duve, is it Duve Hill? Dule Hill. Dule Hill's. They switched his dad. So at one point, his dad is Ernie Hudson. And then when they don't, can't get Ernie Hudson, it's um, Keith David. And his mom is Felicia Rashad. And then the main guy's dad is Corbin Burnson. And his mom is, oh, my God. But yeah, they have Christy Swanson. They have William Shatner, Jeffrey Tambor, Anthony Michael Hall, Mira Sorvino, um, Ali Sheedy. Oh, Ali Sheedy is like a, rec- a recurring character. She's Mr. Yang. 
Yes. Oh, you know who's also fucking amazing in Psych is um shit from Robin Hood Men in Tights and um Princess Bride. Carrie Ellis, I just said his name. Oh, Carrie Ellis. He's a recurring and he is so good. He plays like he's basically the Pink Panther. Like he's he plays an international super thief. Uh, so yeah, this is this is basically a long winded way to tell our audience, please go watch Psych. It's so fucking good. Yes. And especially like basically so um Timothy Olmanson, is that his name? Yes. Um, he was on the show. He's like one of the co-stars of the show. He was on that, uh, Gallivant, if you ever watched. Um, he's been around for a long time. He was in a season of Lucifer that he played God Johnson. Um, he had a, yeah, he had a stroke, like almost like months after filming that episode of Lucifer. And they built that into the second movie. The second movie basically, is all about him and they build in his struggle of like recovering from a stroke yeah, into the show into the, the movie. That's why he was absent from the first psych movie. If yes. I recall, because he had the stroke. Yeah. Um, so they basically build the entire plot of the second movie around him and they had his character have a stroke. So, and he's like a big dude and he's not that old. Um, but they, but had, like, they had a whole episode that spoofed twin peaks. Like God, oh, of they got the entire cast of twin peaks in it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, what's her name? Tyler, I feel like, is listening to this going, like, what's happening? Because the priest is a recurring character in the show. I, like, literally know nothing about about Psych. Uh, I it's, I know that it's, like, they're, like, pretending to be psychic. One guy. And, it, and, like, that's, like, the hook of the show. He's, yeah, he has a photographic memory, and his so does his dad. His dad wanted him to be a cop, but he's just, like, a fuck up. Um, and then he's just, like has a friend and they're goofy and they it's a procedural it's a very comedy heavy procedural but it's very like very like one of those like cult shows like yes it's a show that has its own devoted fan base built in absolutely yeah and they, it, it's also a show that like knows what it is like i think they did an episode where it's like gus's friends and it's from like when he grew up and it's oh my god the guy that played urkel and keenan thompson i believe are his two childhood like black friends? It's like where did you? It's like oh. we met at camp, and then they're like in an episode together. It's like oh, he's hanging out with his camp it's, friends. It's a show that very much like winks at the camera every episode. Oh, absolutely! Like they had a musical episode, and it's brilliant. Uh, I like that you're you bring up that it, it's the guy who played Urkel. When I was like, oh, the guy who voiced Sonic. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I forget that he did that. Um, those are his two credits. So if we could spin back, yeah, Grant Morrison talking about how he's non-binary. I feel like anyone who has yeah, read I'm anything not, of his is not surprised. Lou, I'm just going to really quickly correct so that we don't get yelled at. It's not, he's bi- He's not binary. It's that they're not binary, just to correct. Okay. They, they, they them, yeah. Okay. But yeah, uh, I'm not necessarily surprised, but it's like, very nice that they were able to like come out and like, you know, like say because like again still in like 2020 it's still kind of important to you know when prominent people come out um to like you know you know to help the others reason, the reason why they decided to come out is they wanted to let people know that they, there's no reason to be afraid and mm-hmm. to yeah. give them that give they want to give people the confidence yes and just to get from I did not know that they chose a new pronoun um to reference themselves until I'm now reading yeah, quotes. Fine, fine. It's, yeah. it's, uh, that's how we didn't know, and that's why I literally just saw somewhere, like, every interview I've seen is referring to they, they, they. Yeah, I did not see that. I just saw the headline. Um, but Morrison said to, like, do a quote, which I think is, like, important to think was, like, terms like gender, queer, non-binary only came into vogue in, like, the mid-90s. So, that's why, you know, kids... He, uh, they're saying that kids like them are uh, didn't have the words to talk about stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think it's mostly like uh, Morrison didn't need to do this. You know, it's more about doing this for other people, not just in the industry, but in general. Um, but I just so happened I know his. New, uh, God damn it! Sorry. Uh, Morrison, I'm just gonna try to use last name so I don't fuck it up because I don't want to fuck it up. The, the pronouns. I just got um, the third volume three 
uh, Morrison's Batman Omnibus, and I know that he, uh, fuck the Justice League uh, Omnibus just came out, and I cannot wait to get that. Except it's really expensive. <laughs> well, you're making an effort, and we can appreciate it. <laughs> I, I'm terrible. I'm, I feel so bad because I have trans. I know it's different family members, and I've done this before. It's just. It, it, I don't know. I've never encountered. Actually, no. I have somebody that's non-binary too. Um, it's easier when you don't know. For me, at least, when you're not trying to change how you reference somebody for a long time. And so, as Morrison has been like a part of like my comic life, like it's just trying to switch those pronouns. Although I mostly just refer to it to to them as like the god that is Grant Morrison. So. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, I, yeah, I, feel- I uh, I need to read. Like, I'm like looking at like because I really like a lot of Grant Morrison. Uh, and there's like some stuff I kind of like. I want to revisit uh, Final Crisis again. I Final Crisis, I have it's, um, read it. it's really good. Because I think Final Crisis is like the last great DC event. Um, and I kind of like just want to revisit it because it's like, and like you know, and also like read. Multiversity, because I never got around to reading it. Multiversity is like I'm trying to think. I wouldn't even describe it as something that's like a real it's like comic. A, it's, it's like a, a it's it's a comic reader's comic. It's like it's yeah, like, yeah. Much of it is like seeped in like lore of in history of not yeah. only just DC comics but comics in general. Like there's like, there's like eight pages thing. just describing different Earths. Like, there's an entire issue that's basically, like, a Watchmen analog with, like, the original, um, like, uh, Charlton co- uh, characters. Yes, yes. Uh, I do want to read I, I, And I hear it's, like, a, a way better homage to Watchmen than, like, what the last, like, three or the four Jones. years. What, yeah. Um, I would highly recommend the Batman run, the... Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's what it has to do with the character Black Mask. It is like one of my favorite runs because what Morrison did was took the entire insane Batman lore and made it in continuity in a very oh. weird way. Oh yeah, the Black Glove. Uh, yeah, the Black Glove. That's what I'm talking about. That's in the yeah. second Omni, and I think it's part of Final Crisis. Yeah, it's uh, Batman and Son. It, like it starts at Batman and Son, and then it goes through like uh, a bunch of different stories, like Batman R.I.P., Final Crisis, um, Bruce Wayne going through time. I forget what the name of that mini was. Uh, Batman Incorporated, uh, Batman and Robin, and then like it even like goes into the New Fifty Two with uh, Batman Incorporated, and it kind of ends there. Yes. Um, so I just started reading the third volume, um, where I'm at. Batman goes to kind of deal with making a Japanese Batman, and he goes there with Catwoman. And, and they fight good. a giant octopus? That is part of it, but before that, they go to find the guy who they're gonna he's gonna offer the job to, and he runs a comic book shop. And Catwoman's, like, looking around, and she picks up a hentai of, like, a girl with tentacles around. He's like, and she's like, why do they do this? And for, like, the next, like, three pages, she's reading the hentai. Yeah. And she's just making facial reactions. <laughs> Dude, like, I, like, I know, like, a lot of people, like, and I, like, I like Scott Snyder Batman, like, but man, like, I fucking love Grant Morrison Batman. <laughs> yes, and it's not, like, I know, like, I'm a Batman head, but, like, the new X-Men book Morrison did is also fucking amazing. The Doom Patrol book, I yeah. have to go back, I have the Omni for that, too, I have to read that. I'm, like, a... I have to go back. It's like hard to go through, but I have the Invisible Omni. I'm like a yeah, quarter uh, of the way through. That is super dense, like heady, trippy stuff. Yeah, that like uh, basically I Morrison never, doing magic. Well, it's Morrison doing uh, because essentially it's him doing like the Matrix. Yes, but he wrote oh, himself like into he, the comic. It's like it's a like, magic ritual, like real life. Morrison was doing a magic y ritual by making a comic book with himself in it to build himself to for them to build themselves up to it's like it's it's like super I because if you listen to um like last podcast on the left, they reference invisibles all the time because Morrison 
is really into because he's king real mob. life magic. Yes, he's King Mob. Which also is like if you read that, it's like that character is very fluid in every way possible. Yeah. Um, and I and, and like I I also like to bring up like I know that like the idea that he wrote the Invisibles and then like you know the, the scuttle is that the Wachowskis used it borrowed very heavily from the Invisibles for the Matrix, but like that's also like a thing that's like never been like super confirmed. So like that's the only reason I brought that up. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, I uh, I know that like my my old boss like he read the Invisibles and he also had like a lot of the same things to say where it's just like it's just very like dense. Um, it's very dense. Like it's definitely a book. Like I got through. It's like fifteen hundred pages. I got through like three or four hundred. I'm like I need to take a good couple months break and come back to it. Also. He, uh, Morrison was fired, I think, where the company he was writing at um, went down. So part of the book is it's, the Omni is published by Vertigo, but parts of the book were per, were published not from Vertigo. Oh wow! So it's wow. it's one of those books that like moved around. And like they fired him from like that company. I don't know if they fired him or the company went under. I'm pretty sure the book was also like super late all the time. Uh, yeah, that probably sounds about right. Um, but yeah, like I I want to read the Invisibles at some point. I know like we also sold a what do they call that when it's like a um, it's like a book that explains the pages of like each thing of a of another book. It's like a not a compendium but like a annotated. It's like an annotated oh, yes. Invisibles. And they had like we sold that along with our Invisibles book. Yeah, I'm looking. So the the first volumes from '94 to '96, the second volumes from '97 to '99, and the third volumes from '99 to 2000. Uh, but yeah, it's like kind of funny because like it's not the like Morrison writing himself in the Invisibles is not the first time he's written himself within a comic. It's like you know, it's like there's also that really famous Alma Man story, and then that character shows up and dies in Suicide Squad. Yeah. I think... Is it named... Is the character named Morrison? I feel like... Um, his, his name is, like, the writer or something. Yeah. Um, I feel like Doom Patrol had some of that, too. Which, basically, the Doom Patrol TV show is Morrison's Doom Patrol. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like it's like so funny that like Grant Morrison does like this really celebrated run on Doom Patrol and like like kind of becomes like the Doom Patrol like you know for like a lot of like newer generation of like comic fans and then DC was just like for so long they were like uh like we're going to treat Doom Patrol in the DC completely different so they would like keep on like trying to reboot the Doom Patrol the DCU as being like like more superhero-y and yeah, it was like, like try to make them actual X-Men not yeah, like Yeah and it was just like it just never worked and it was just like so bad and like it, it like it wasn't until like Gerard Way like did Doom Patrol and it was yeah, like oh, I was going to say this exactly is, this, is, this is what the book should have been for like the last like 20 years you know Yeah and well, Gerard has basically said it, Morrison is a giant inspiration for him which you can see in his X Men oh. work and his Doom Patrol work. Well, not only that, but Gerard Way or not, um, Grant Morrison shows up in My Couple of Romance videos. Like he's the main villain, or he's like one of the main villains in like those series of Killjoy videos. He's like the agent that works for Better Living Industries. Oh, I'm not a big My Chemical Romance person, so like, yeah. This and is then when they me. did, and then when they did the comic, uh, that character. Very much looks like Grant Morrison is like well, one of the main characters for that book. Make like a bald white guy looking person. Sure, and, and I think like it also like kind of helps that Grant Morrison is just like he's like a very. It's like you know, it's, it's like seeing Alan Moore. It's like you can't mistake him. Like yeah, because I can't remember in. Oh my god, what is? I always forget the because DC owns them now. Where Grifter is from? What comic? Uh, Wildstorm. Yeah, and like the last Wildstorm, they where they did, and I really do like the run, um, the Michael McRae book that they did, when he, their version of Constantine in that world is Grit Morrison. Oh, that's funny. Like it's 
it's, it's you know Scottish bald head smoking doing drugs to making magic um yeah I feel like we went on like a really crazy but fun tangent but yeah uh I'm gonna finish reading this volume three uh Batman Omni and then I will probably work my way back to the Invisibles one um kind of sticking with Warner Brothers uh we were talking about a little bit before we started recording like so the, the tiny tunes is it a reboot or just a new show uh it's it's being called tiny tunes university so it, it probably is going to be like a like a slight like, a slight rebooty version of tiny tune adventures um, yeah. like like they they show like uh buster and babs like in this like promotional art and buster is like has like a red coat and I babs is wearing like a out. pink and yellow sweater uh, and like they look great like they look perfect I would just like to point out that um, Siler said rebooty, and the headline here is they're tiny, they're tuny, they get a little rebooty. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, this is supposed to be for uh, HBO Max. Uh, this is on the tales of uh, Animaniacs coming to Hulu. Uh, I don't know if it's out there yet or if it's coming out soon, but which uh, is weird. that is weird that it's going to Hulu as that's Disney. Uh, I think. I I'm think, wondering well, if that's a previous deal from before all that. Uh, I, from what I understand, like Hulu very much paid for it. Like, oh. like they this was a thing that Hulu like specifically paid for. Um, so it could have been before the Hulu deal. Like, I I don't know, but like from what it looks like, it was a thing that Hulu kind of like wants to get like more kids programming on, on their on their service, and it's like, oh hey, like why don't we get this? You know. Um, oh, and like, I'm looking here. Think, it's going. The Tiny Tunes is going to HBO Max and Cartoon Network. Oh, that's um, cool. Well, yeah, but like a lot of the stuff that's been going to HBO Max is is like, oh, it's going to be on Cartoon Network also. You know, it's like, yes, uh, like Infinity Train season three. Um, like they say that that's also on Cartoon Network, but I've all like I've never seen Infinity Train on Cartoon Network. Like I I'm guessing once they finish like a season on HBO Max, then they'll move it over to Cartoon Network. Uh, maybe, but like, from also like, I think Infinity Train, like, if we're just talking about that, is a show that's like a lot kind of darker than I think, like, they're the that they kind of like cater to their core audience for mm. uh, on Cartoon Network. Like, like I, I don't know if you guys have seen Infinity Train, but it, it's like really good. Uh, it's basically about like the first season's about a girl named Tulip who um, runs away from home and. Uh, ends up like hopping aboard like this train, and it's like a train that goes on for like infinity. And she has like a number like on her wrist that basically like you know as she like does certain things throughout the shit or throughout the train, like her number will go up or down, and she meets like some like you know kind of fun characters along the way. Uh, but yeah, it's like it's like oddly very dark, but like good like it's not like it's like courage dark but like it doesn't like have like the humor that courage tries to do Mm. um but yeah it's like i i think like you'll you'll start seeing like a lot of stuff being hbo max like exclusive and and to be completely honest like hbo max is like kind of like really killing it in its animation department because i think they they're like really doing like a lot of cool stuff over you know, like no, this for, like, is like a young. cool art style. It's like I don't even know how to describe it because it's it feels anime esque in like the color palette. Uh, yeah, like at least from uh, the stills I'm looking at. Also, it's three seasons. Yep. Uh, each season I think is about six to ten episodes, and each episode is about fifteen episodes, uh, fifteen minutes each. Uh, oh. And you second, just, I will probably rip through this show this week. Yeah, the second season's like about like a different character on, on the train, and then the third season is about two characters you meet during season two. So it's like each season is about like different people interacting on like this train. Oh, cool. Uh, 
but yeah, like I'm I'm pretty excited for new Tang tunes. Like um, I was talking about like before this uh, the show, or like I I like the main bits of Animaniacs, but I was like never a Pinky in the Brain guy. Like I just never thought it was all that funny, and I kind of really don't get it. Um, but like Tang Tune Adventures like was totally my jam, and. I'm like kind of very excited to see like these cast of characters return. Like, like that show is like how I discovered like uh, they may be giants uh, and uh, a lot and a little a lot of other music. So yeah, I, I'm excited. Yeah, I I I was a fan of Pinky of the Brain, but I get what you mean. Like, I feel like I don't know. I think I was in like that age, although we're at the same age. Like, it just hit me in a good spot. But especially because, like, I watched, like, basically Saturday morning on WB every Saturday, like, nonstop for, like, the entire animated run. This is probably completely wrong, but I feel like if you saw one Pinky in the Brain episode, I feel like you saw all the Pinky in the Brain episodes. I don't think you're wrong. That's fair. But I feel like that's, you could say that about a, a lot of kids' cartoons, especially of that era. Because yeah. I could say that for Animaniacs, like it's kind of the same bits every episode. Oh yeah, that and that's why I was kind of like, oh, I, I, it's fine. Like I, I feel I felt there was like more variety to. Which, what is funny though is that like the Tiny Toons team that made that show originally is like all the people from um, like the Dini, uh, the Dini verse kind of yep. uh, comic book stuff. It's the same group. So yeah, like so, it's like it has such a great pedigree, um, which I know I started watching a little bit when HBO Max first dropped. Um, I think I started watching the Justice League cartoon again, and I was like, man, this is like it is still such a it, good goddamn cartoon. It, it's great. It's so cool how like some of those animated cartoons like really hold up well after all these years. Oh, it holds up so well. It's really, like it's it's preposterous. Just, Justice League is twenty next year. Think about that. Holy fuck. Yeah, because, yeah, I was like in middle school when it came out. It, like, I'm the, like, me and Siler are like the perfect age when that hit. Um, yeah, I love those shows. Um, I don't know. Is there any other newsy? Do we want to talk about the other news thing and then talk about what we've been reading? Because I can make a please uh, segue from that news piece into what I've been reading. Is the news piece thing the Avengers game? Yes. Uh, yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm sad because I just bought that game for like thirty bucks. Yeah, like I, I would say before we like good to go into this. I played the game. I enjoy the game. I think it's a fun game. Now moving on, it is maybe the worst marketed thing I've ever seen ever. Not marketed well because like the beta basically lied about what the game is. Like, and if you watch anybody's reviews on it or streaming it, like, it's not the game the beta showed. It's also not the game that they presented to people. Um, it also came with not a lot to do. It's very repetitive. Uh, it's very grindy because it's Destiny, but with the ventures. So if you know that, you can have fun with that. But that is not what they sold to you, and that is not what they tried to show. They also did not display, which I think was the main thing we were talking about before. The trailer doesn't show the main goddamn character of the game. Like, your viewpoint character is Kamala Khan. Like, that is the main character of the game. And they never displayed that in any of the ads. So, uh, the reason why we're talking about this is that it's reported that Square Enix lost $48 million uh, following the release of the Avengers game. Uh, yes. This is also yes. on the back of... Uh, the next-gen ports of Avengers for the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series? series? I would just say Series, because it has the two systems. The next box. The uh, next, oh, perfect, next box. Uh, is basically going back in the oven. Uh, they've been pushed back. Uh, I don't know if that means that they're outright cancelled, uh, considering... I... The- don't uh, think so, based on how much it seems that they have developed into them. Yeah, I I don't think so either. But you know, I just I was like, maybe maybe this is a thing. But like, yeah, I think I think we'll see like a retooled version of this game come out pretty uh, you know later next yeah. year because we have uh, we've had no DLC, which it's all free, but no, all the DLC also got pushed back. It was supposed to come out last month. Uh, the one with Kate Bishop. 
Yes. Yeah, I, you know, it's like, I remember when that game was, like, first shown off, like, during that big uh, Square Enix press conference during E3, and just being, like, so underwhelmed. Like, the character designs were, like, very bad, and, like, I get, like, you know, it's like, they don't have the licenses to have Chris Evans or Chris Hemsworth. Oh, they're such bad almost nots. Of it's, them, <laughs> it's like the porn parody versions of them. Oh, it's it's it like, and I think it's like even like more insulting because like Square Enix is like not a small company. It's like you look, you know, it's like you look at you know, like their their like their Japanese publishing or developing wing with like the stuff that you know they released Final Fantasy VII this year, and then you see like the stuff that you know Crystal Dynamics and IDOS had like you know, published in the past with, like, the Hitman games and the Tomb Raider games, and they're, like, good. But it's just, like, whether it's, like, the director of the game or company, like, guidelines or Marvel guidelines or Disney guidelines, like, there's, like, something that, like, it's just, like, from top to bottom. That game was just, like, such a disaster. Like, and it, it was just, like, the, the first misstep with, like, the big unveil of the game looked bad. And then they did show off Kamala Khan to like that second trailer, but like it was also like around that time you start realizing that this game's just gonna be full of microtransactions and it's gonna be a live service game, which is which, just like makes me positive. automatically it, not want to play it. It isn't though. Like that's the thing, it's like they advertise it so poorly that it actually isn't those things. Cause like you don't have you there's really nothing to buy. All the purchasing stuff is cosmetics. It doesn't do anything to how you play. It doesn't affect your power levels. None of that stuff. It's just sure. what costumes you're wearing and but your I, nameplate. But I think it's like also, it's like when you look at something like the Spider-Man game and they give you that stuff like throughout the progress of playing the game. It's well, you like, can get it that way too. Sure, but it's like, is like, it's like, is the monetary grind of the game at a decent rate to where it feels like you're earning something and not just like I will say from what my playthrough of it yes I have not at all and I will say I've never been tempted to buy like compared to other games and services that I've played not at all like looking at um the only one I can really think of is uh Battlefront Mm -hmm. like it's not that like it's already like Unless you really, 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 like, really, really need to have, like, a Black Widow costume where she's wearing a gray tr- trench coat with blonde hair instead of the black trench coat with red hair. Oh, she's or, essentially Yana Belova. Yes, which that's only one of 17 different skins with her having blonde hair. Yeah. Um, and then there was it, that news about spider-man being exclusive to the playstation brand of the avengers games yeah that's so so essentially it's like if you buy the xbox version you're buying a lesser game yeah but that gets into the whole rights thing like that's not even squares that's sony like strong arming which i under i get sony's point it's so sony paying for it which like at the end of the day i don't even think that was a good investment (laughs) It's like well, uh, I don't even know they're paying for. Like they own the rights to the character. Considering how well the game's doing right now, <sighs> like again, well, it's I, that, I don't know if it's just because it's like Black Friday deals or what, but it's now half off. Yeah, I mean, like I'll buy a- Avengers when it's like twenty bucks. Like that's like that's like a good price for that game. I feel yeah, like but it's like thirty bucks right now. I my favorite. Like I don't know if I, I sent this to you guys, but like. Uh, a Maximilian dude was playing the Avengers, and he clipped a part of the game where it's like the big climactic moment of like the end, where like Miss Marvel turns super big and she yells and big in, and she's about to strike this giant robot, and like, and she's about to hit the robot, the game crashes, and he's just like, mm. uh, yeah, man, like, I like I don't take 
it's like I, I, I don't want to feel like this like victory lap of me feeling like I'm right about oh, the game. The, the game is definitely like like, me, like because I want, I, because it's like I've been like wanting an Avengers game for so fucking long, and I feel like that rumored Square Enix Avengers game had been in the works for like five years. Like I yeah. even know that there are like reports that they, that that this is not the first version of oh, a Square no. Enix yeah. Avengers game. You can tell, and I'll say this, that they're... Because I would say this, the story, I think the story is written very well in, like, like the campaign mode. Like, Modok is the main villain of that game. I should love that. Yeah, and it's done well. And, like, all the voice acting and stuff is really good. The problem is, like, it's not super long. There is end game stuff, but it's a lot of grinding. But, like, it's also, like, they advertise this as, like, it's... It plays like kind of like a Destiny game. I'm not saying it's like I being able to pick up two people as the Hulk and smash other people with them is yes. very enjoyable. Like yes. it has all that fun stuff. It's just if you don't like a game like Destiny, then you will not like this game. Yeah, and and I think like that's like my thing. It's like I it's like I play Overwatch. I I don't need really any other games that are based around leveling and loot boxes and all this other mm. shit it's like uh well, there aren't, like, I, I will say there's no there's not loot boxes and there's no pvp like it's just pve mm-hmm. yeah and i think and, it's like and, also and, with, and the pc version is like batman arkham knight level broken which i don't even know if they've ever fixed that like arkham knight oh well, yeah well um man talk about another bad game mm. uh but uh, yeah, and I think it's like also it's like this tag teamed with Marvel versus Capcom Infinite being so bad. It's just like, man, can't yeah. can't can't these Avengers games be good? But like you know, it's like I think it's like also it's just like a reminder at the end of the day, like there's a reason why people look so fondly on those old Spider-Man games is because a lot of other superhero games were like very bad. Well, yeah, and that's why it's the, also like and that's why those it, Batman it, games are so celebrated because a lot of DC games were really bad. Well, yeah. And basically, I feel like there's only like, if I look back, there's only like three series of comic book inspired games that are good. It's like that specific set of Spider-Man games and the non kind of open world ones are like iffy. Um, And then the Arkham games. Uh, Yeah. And then I would put the Ultimate Alliance in there and like X-Men Legends as like one series. And then that's like it. Like what other good comic book game? Like comic book s games are there? Uh, Spider Man One Two for the PlayStation. Spider Man One and Two for the PlayStation Two. Uh, the first two Arkham games. Uh, the Marvel Marvel versus Capcom games. Yeah, and but like I, I almost don't that... even count them as comic book games. Like they're fighters. Well, X Men. Okay. Well, what about just X Men Children of the Atom? That's just X Men Fighter. Like that game's great. Uh, yeah, but then would you include like Injustice? Oh yeah. I'm yeah, totally but like, I, I, I guess they have characters, but like you're not really playing. I don't know. Like I almost put fighters in like a different thing because it's almost like it could be any other game. You're just reskinning. Um, not really, because I think Injustice and M- Mortal Kombat play very differently. Like mm. the the Marvel Capcom games, for the most part, do play like do play they're Street game. Fighter. Yeah. Uh they're like. Street or, Fighter on like cocaine, well, like, like or like very, Capcom versus SNK, like it's uh, yeah. Capcom versus SNK and Mar- Marvel versus Capcom play very differently. Uh, but no. I don't know. I, I feel like there's like a fighter aspect that's like a little different. Like I like there are and to remove like there's like a couple other comic book yes, game like comic book character games that are good, but I feel like they kind of fall into the same issue that like movie video games fall into where it's just so it's like we're gonna just make money off of this license oh yep you know what belongs in there and it's also i would put it like kind of in a subgenre is the lego games but they're lego games so those are all good but like both dc and the marvel lego games are great i think it's just like i think yeah i think though it's like you look at the end of the day and it's like you have two major companies doing like you have Sony doing Spider Man and you have Square Enix doing Avengers. And it's like if you got a good team with a creative vision, and I'm not even like 
And like again, like I'm on my own island. I think I think that last Spider-Man game I think is like very good. I don't like the story, and I and like it's not like necessarily like kind of like my cup of tea. Like I'm more excited for the Miles Morales game. Like that's the game I kind of really oh, wish that. And I'm excited game for that game, but I love the other Spider-Man game. But, but like even that being said, it's like you you look at. You know, if you put like the time and the energy and the creativeness and a good team and you put out a good game, it's like you'll make money. It's like like I don't understand like some of these companies that just get a license and then they think it's like, oh yeah, we'll just like put out anything and it'll just make money. And it's like and I and you know, sometimes that works. But you know what? A lot of times it doesn't. And it's like yeah. if only if I feel like if Square Enix like had like a you know maybe a better team put together a better director you know maybe like some like you know understanding of the kind of game that they want from like the beginning and like this feels like very much of a sunken cost fallacy it's like they had this license and they spent so long at certain point they were just like just get it out there and like we'll just make whatever on it oh i think it's i think it definitely was not finished i think it's also at some point, it was a single player game, and then it got changed into this online service game. Yeah, and you can feel that. And I'm hoping, like Destiny Two, that like it'll have like a second life. Um, yep. Or what, what was that other one that came out that sucked really hard and it's supposed to be uh, good now? No Man's Sky. That's exactly it. Like, like I, I, I hope it ends and, up being that. And No Man's Sky like didn't suck. It was just like this didn't one deliver on made... every anything it said. <laughs> It like it kind yeah it kind of just didn't really deliver in the way that the marketing like kind of boasted that game would do. But now that game totally does what that game purported to do, and like it just you know just needed a little extra time in the oven. And like that's kind of like a big thing about like this console generation was uh, you know uh, Final Fantasy uh, fourteen launched launched super disastrously like that game was such a piece of shit when that game launched and now the game's like it you know it took a couple years and it got to like a state of play that's the that online like, one right yeah it got to a state of play that was super enjoyable and now people really love it and like i don't know if you can really rehab a game like avengers in the way that no man because like no man's sky and final fantasy 14 truly are like games that just like you know, as long as you make new content for it, it's like it'll always kind of just be a game that you'll have like a good steady, you know, user base for. The Avengers game is like it's like a single player game. Or it's like a a single not a single player game, but it's like a single story game that is supposed to have like updated, you know, characters to it. But it's like if you're not adding more story to the world, like kind of like a Marvel's Ultimate Alliance where it's like each new DLC has like a new story pack to play. Sort of. Really only the last one did. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how you rehab that game, but you know, it's like... I, I think the, what, the only thing it'll do is like the introducing of new characters in both, you know, heroes and villains and adding more story might bring people in just because they're fans of those characters. Like... Mm -hmm. I mean, like Kate Bishop, I, I, I love her. Like, I will absolutely play a game with Kate Bishop in it. Uh, and like, I, I love Miss Marvel, but, but you know, it's like I really think that she really should have been front and center in that first piece of you yeah, know promotional stuff. Yes, yeah, we can hear okay. you. Um, and I think they kind of just like need more stuff like that. You know, it's like I think it's like really important to have like your your Hulks, your Iron Mans, your you know, Captain America's, because that's how you're going to get, like, your hardcore um, Marvel fans in. But it's, like, your Squirrel Girls, like, your your um, your X-Men characters. Like, that's kind of, like, how you, you know, build an audience. Because, like, those, like, kind of niche characters, like, really do, like, have a fan base that are, like, will check you out if, if you do offer that stuff. Yeah. Um, before, like, you know, we go too far... I do think, you know, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think it's, like, the issues with this game. But why don't we talk about some comics that we've been reading um, before we finish out. Um, let's start with John Scott before his internet dies on him again. Are you there, John? Oh, no. Did we lose him again? All right. Uh, Siler, what have you been reading? Uh, I've been... Um, 
I've been like kind of busy with work to like ship out a bunch of books. So like a lot of my stuff has been kind of like um, getting caught up on web comics and stuff. So uh, I'm currently up to date on a web comic called Dumbing of Age. Uh, it is currently within its like new semester a book or uh, of the series. It's like a uh, well, this would be like their. I think that it's like their at them coming back from winter break. And it's like you know, first year character, or, you know, characters in college. A bunch of crazy stuff has been happening over the book over the last like I think eight to ten years. The book, the 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 comic has been running, uh, but now we kind of have uh, them coming back from winter break. Um, some characters have returned, you know, have not returned, and we don't know why. So, uh, a lot of characters have returned. Some new characters. Um, and we know every one of the base cast except for one, which has not been revealed yet. Uh, and that's been like really fun. Uh, I've also been reading uh, Strange Academy from Marvel, and uh, this is kind of just like the book I wish was in like an X Men book right now. It's uh, yeah, I haven't even the, heard of this. Uh, so Strange Academy is a new academic school for magic users. Um, it's run by like Doctor Strange, like Damon Hellstrom's there. Uh, basically, all the big magic users of the DCU, you know, are either teachers or work at the school. And we have like a bunch of new characters uh, who are showing up in the book. Uh, some of them are like descendants of other characters or are from like different planes of existence. Uh, one of the main characters that's been uh, um, uh, shown off in the book is Doyle Dharmamu, who is the son of Dharmamu. And his name is Doyle? It's Yeah. And he basically just looks like a kid version of Dharmamu. Uh, but yeah, it's like really fun. Uh, the latest issue is uh, there's like some weird like group called the Hollow that are in uh, New Orleans who are like trying to steal these kids uh, from the school but they don't know that like what's happening so they're on like this they end up like doing like this big interdimensional game of tag where uh they're like chasing each other through time warps or time portals and like there's like a part where spider-man saves one of the kids uh them running through like asgard or weird world um it's like really fun it's it's four issues so far uh it's written by scotty young and a lot of people know Scotty Young as the artist for like a lot of the little Marvel stuff mm-hmm. um, or the X Baby stuff, uh, and it's drawn by Her- Humberto Ramos, who is predominantly known for doing like a lot of Spider Man artwork. But yeah, his art's like so good, and it's like still trying to kind of like get its footing. Like it's it's like kind of like the problem where you ha- you're introduced a big huge cast of characters, uh, and the book is like a monthly. Which is like kind of refreshing, but like also like you have to just kind of like get like a refresher on like a lot of these characters each month. Um, but yeah, like I kind of wish that within the Krakoa books there was like a X Men Academy book, but like this kind of like scratches that itch. Yeah, I get what you mean because like even like the New Mutants books, like they're in their mid to late twenties. Yep. yep. Yeah, maybe they'll do something after Swords of X or. Ten of Swords, um, yep. which has been really fun so far. Um, yeah, I uh, that was my other thing is like I got caught up on all the X Men books right before Ten of Swords, so like I'm gonna basically read Ten of Swords this week. Yeah, it's like oh, where it's just at the point where like the tournament's about to begin. Uh, I I heard that Jim Jaspers is back, which is exciting. Yes, he's big. He in the newer stuff because I think we talked about him. Maybe last time we talked about stuff, I don't remember. He's mm-hmm. legit, like in one of the books. He's he caters their dinner, <laughs> which is like very frightening. <laughs> yes, because um, he's like one of the representatives of Otherworld, and he's like catering the big dinner, um, like their banquet that they have between the two sides. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, I've read all that stuff, so. It's uh, so uh just to like there's like two other books I want to talk about. Uh Runaways number 32. Uh they Marvel just was like, "Oh hey, Marvel uh Runaways is coming back uh this week." Like it was like 
just like announced like the comic book stores didn't even know they were getting it until they got it essentially um and runaways before the pandemic was one of my favorite marvel books and at, like in, it's still like after the pandemic runaways is still one of my favorite books like this book is great it's as good as the brian k vaughn runaways run um like the, like before the pandemic they have this big storyline where uh, they ended up joining up with this guy who wanted to re-establish like this old teen team of superheroes, but he was also like a psychopath, and they ended up defeating him. And now everything is like kind of like back to normal with them going back to their hideout. Uh, and it's you know it's just like a kind of like a really fun book. Um, you know, one of the characters wants to go back to school. Uh, uh, one of the other characters, who's like a mutant, is like looking at a pamphlet to go to Krakoa. Um, you know, some other characters trying to like figure out like what they're going to do. Uh, like one of my favorite bits is uh, Doombot is like a he's been like kind of like a a minor character within the Runaways book because he's like linked to one of the other Runaways, and Doombot ends up moving in with them. Oh, because he's really to oh my god, I can't remember the character's name. It's been so long. Yeah, he's he's like good friends with um oh my god. I like the, like Victor. Like yes. Victor Victor and Doombot used to be teammates on Avengers AI, which was a robot themed Avengers team. And uh I and I love that like someone kinda like picked that up and basically wrote Doombot within this book. Uh, cause like Doombot I think is just like a really fun character and he also has like maybe like my favorite design like one of my favorite designs for doom um but yeah like this book was like a really kind of like really nice surprise and i i'm glad that's back and if you're not reading runaways you should be running reading runaways uh and the last book i want to talk about is uh Tr- transformers uh my little pony friendship in disguise which is <laughs> it is still like such a fun book uh the uh number four came out this week but i haven't read it yet uh but number three it, so basically each issue is split into two halves where uh the first half is like one of the other main six meets like one of the transformers and then fights them or and then fights like another group of transformers and the second half is like kind of the same story but it's like the the ponies meeting like their transformer uh counterpart counterpart and then fighting like a villain who is like totally within their wheelhouse uh so the first half of this one is fluttershy and discord having a tea party with their animals and soundwave shows up and soundwave like basically shoots out like laser beak and ravage and all the other animal cassettes and like at first, like Fluttershy is like scared, but then she sees that they're animals, and she's like really excited, and she's like trying to like help out like the the Transformer robot animals. Um, <laughs> but like Discord's like, uh, I wouldn't trust this guy, man. <laughs> uh, but they end up like having like a big fight where uh, Soundwave basically like makes fun of his like robot animals and. The robot animals turn on Soundwave because oh. because Fluttershy is freeing them nicely and like <laughs> is also, like has respect for them and it's like really nice. Uh, but the second half is with uh, Rainbow Dash and she meets Windblade and it's like them two like going on a race to figure out like who the fastest Transformer or like who the fastest being is and then uh, oh my god like who shows up. Oh, it's um, Misfire and a bunch of other like flying Transformers, and yeah, Rainbow Dash and Windblade, uh, basically like run circles around them and like blow them up, and yeah, it's like great. It's like so fun. It's like <laughs> a, a, a crossover between like these two very polar opposite books. Really, kind of shouldn't work as well as it does, uh, but I think it's like it, it's like a lot of fun, and it's a. Uh, it's written by James Asmus, or this issue is written by James Asmus, who wrote uh, some Gambit stories for Marvel. Um, he wrote uh, some stuff for um, 
Oh my god, what's the name of that company that has Ninjak and... Valiant? Quam- Valiant. Uh, he wrote some Quam and Woody for Valiant uh, in Return of the Dapper Men, which was like kind of like a neat IDW independent book from about eight years ago. I love how uh, you said Ninjak and not the character that they had a movie come out for this year. Uh, bl- oh yeah, man. Bl- God, man. <laughs> we Bloodshot, we watched. <laughs> Bloodshot feels like it came out so long ago. <laughs> uh, and then the second story is written by Sam Mags, who I'm not super familiar with, but yeah. Uh, both stories are like a real hoot. Uh, this book is still fun. Uh, if if you like either uh property, I think it's like a real fun read. Yeah. Um. So besides, like I already said, like I read those Marvel books. I read the Juggernaut one. Um, it's interesting. It's not connected, pretty much. Like they reference stuff going in Krakoa, and Charles shows up psychically. But other than that, there's nothing connected to anything. Um, and but like the main two things I want to talk about is I read Joker War, and I finished the three Jokers. Uh, it's like really funny because there's like two comics podcasts I listen to, um, and like one of them really loved Joker War and hated the Three Jokers, and the other one loved the Three Jokers but hated Joker War. But uh, I I feel like personally as a reader, I would probably have hated Joker, uh, the Three Jokers, and loved Joker War. I would say I don't care for either. Yeah. Um, so the only thing that the two of them do is three jokers fixes the problem of three jokers. <laughs> Joker war fixes the problem that was Dick Grayson. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like like not having read the three jokers and and hearing like what happens in that book. Isn't a lot of what is solved in the three Jokers basically like a problem that Jeff Johns revealed himself? Yes. It solves the problem of them saying that there are three Jokers. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm going to try to be on best I can, but it is maybe temporary. I don't know how well this is going to hold up my internet right now. So, but three Jokers looks like a mess. But anyway. Yeah. It's it's literally a book that solves the problem that John's created by saying there were three jokers. And it uh, the only thing that I kind of and I like and don't like is the ending of it is that is it basically say that like um I'm trying to think I'll just say like spoiler warnings. Do either of you care if I spoil it? Absolutely not. No, I don't care. All right, spoiler warnings for anybody who cares. So, obviously, two of the Jokers get killed. That's how we solve the three Joker problem. Um, um, the entire because it's specifically the the criminal and the clown. The, yes, Jason Todd kills the clown, which it's implied he's the one, maybe, which is the whole annoying shit of it, that killed Jason, and Jason just shoots him in the fucking head. Because uh, the story is, it's Batman, Batgirl, and Red Hood versus these three Jokers. Um, and so each of them find one of the Jokers, and Jason kills the one, which leads them to then kidnapping Jason, and they think about it's basically this idea of like, oh, one of them, we don't know which one, probably the criminal, has been trying to make a better Joker. Um, quote unquote bullshit. So they attempt it with Jason, and then what they end up doing so that doesn't happen, and then Batgirl's basically like her and Jason is, and this is kind of in something they've been playing with different writers of if Barbara and Jason having a relationship. I, and I absolutely hate it. I don't. I I don't mind it because the reason they talk about it is that both of them have had like this similar ish um, trauma, and they and that's how they are connecting. And they talk a lot about their trauma. Sure. But, like, I also, like, feel like Barbara hooking up with Jason is, like, who, like, who, who in this dynamic hasn't, like, hasn't, like, hooked up with Barbara yet? 
oh, like so what like no one's written about the Jason Barbara relationship. Well, like let's like Ooh. write about that. And it's like there's sh- it's like I also like kind of doesn't like okay, so Jason Todd kills the Joker. That's the comedian. That is hinted that is the one that No, he kills the clown. He kills the clown, which is the one that's hinted to be the one with the crowbar. Yes. But wouldn't it have made more sense if the Joker that beat the shit out of Jason Todd is also the one that shot Barbara Gordon? Because that's the Joker that like really like went after the family like hard in that they... like, really sadistic way. Okay, I will say that they that's kind of the big turn of the end that they discuss. Because we never know if any of them are in fact the original. We don't know. <laughs> Which even seems like, even like, uh, like, look, it, like, this yes. honestly, like, seems a lot like Jeff Johns got Jeff fucking Jones high. A, Jeff a Johns problem, got a problem. <laughs> Jeff Johns got high one fucking day, and he's like, "Yo, dog, what if there were like three Jokers? When in fact, like, currently in our current timeline, we have like five Jokers. But you know what? We're not even gonna get into it." Yeah. And then, like, he asks a question that he doesn't really even know the answer to. And even four years after having this question, he still doesn't know what the answer is. Like, motherfucker, Bat- he writes Batman sitting in a Mobius chair and asks the chair who the true identity of the Joker is. And the and the chair is like, hey, man, there's actually three Jokers. And correct me if I'm wrong, but... Isn't the big reveal at the end of the three Jokers is that Batman's like, oh, I knew who the Joker was the whole time. But guess what? That's not important. And then, like, then why did we do this fucking thing with the chair yeah. four years ago? So, yeah, so the, the big reveals are um, so after Jason kills that Joker and they try to turn him, but then they don't, the criminal seems to be the more quote unquote cerebral one. He's, um, he's the one from the War of Jokes and Riddles, who's also he, like classic Joker. Yes, he's classic Joker. Um, is basically they decide to no, the perfect Joker is one that means more to Batman than anything. Which this is the parts of it I like the idea of like the Joker's so obsessed with Batman that he, of being the most important being to him that he would do anything, including making another version of himself that would be the most important thing to Batman. And so yeah. what they do is they kidnap a terminally ill Joe Chill to turn into a new Joker. <laughs> um, and then what's revealed is the comedian then kills the criminal and is like, see, he thought that, but I just said that to like trick him because he wanted all these plans and fuck that guy. He literally is like basically like fuck that guy. He just want I just wanted to get this because what I really wanted was that he gets Batman saves Joe Chill and in saving him kind of heals his wounds. And he's like, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to heal your wounds so that I could make like I could never make a wound as great as him. So now that you've forgiven Joe Chill and like saved his life. It's now open for me to like rip you apart worse than him. And that's kind of how they end. And they end it with like, he's known who he is for a while. He was a comedian who was a drunk. And the cops faked his wife and child's death in order to get them away. And Bat- Bruce knows this. So he's like, yeah, the reason I don't tell anybody who the Joker is, is because that then they would the media would go after his family who's still alive and he would kill them. Does Bruce Wayne not understand that like that family like okay, so like the the police like fake that family's death, right? Yes. It's, like a pair then, of cops. And not then, like all the cops, just like a and, pair. And move them to like a different area, right? Out like a completely different city, yes. Do you think that X Joker wife and kid have the same names as they would have when they are with the Joker? No, but I think the idea is that like they would dig into it. I, it's also this is we're digging, we're going way, we're thinking way too hard about something where it's a comic to fix a problem Jeff Johns made four years ago. Exactly. 
And I think it's just like I think it's like a problem that Jeff Johns never fully thought out. Oh, and just, absolutely and, not. And, and it's just like I can't like I can't wait till like Jeff Johns stops writing comics. Like honestly, like he probably should because like I, like well, look, man, all the like, stuff we talked like, about last time with think, the yeah, Ray Fisher shit like, too. Like think of like how much like mileage this podcast got out of Doomsday Clock <sighs> or. Or like the three jokers, or like any other like ill-conceived Jeff Johns idea, like which, it's, which it's like, crazy which, like, like also I, like by the way like now that he did younger that like I like like I like a lot, but which, like, like you sure, but which by the way also I bring up the War of Jokes and Riddles. The War of Jokes and Riddles was also written at a time where before like they do like the, they revealed the three jokers thing. So was like the joker of the joke jo- war of jokes and riddles like basically like the first like seed point of like this three jokers thing but because like you have this huge upheaval of the dc universe or uh, of, of of people running the company that basically like like put a, a stop to like all this other shit i don't know it, it to me it's like the criminal is the one that was the red hood i don't i don't know and yeah. what's funny is that, like, it that book is almost completely in contradiction to the war or to the Joker War. So to flip yeah. to that one, so Joker War. I, 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 one <laughs> last thing I will say about the, the the three Jokers is like I feel like you know going back to our Grant Morrison conversation, I feel like a lot of the stuff about Joker's relationship with Batman that is like handled within the three Jokers was done so much better with like. Dr. Simon Hurt and like the Black Love and, oh. and, and Grant Morrison's yeah. run. Yes, absolutely. Um, which goes into Joker War. So, the part there are again parts of this that I like, which the idea is that, like, at some point in some point in the past, a myth- mythical, not talked about villain showed up and gave invitations to four people Penguin, Catwoman, Joker, and Riddler, and is basically like, Oh, like I went and like this guy who's a detective always beat me until I took uh, a year and I just sat and thought and worked everything out and then I beat him and broke him. I want to help you do that so that I can then like retire and basically talks through each of them singly. And this is all the setup to. I was going to say, this sounds like a, a, a guy at a motel who's like. It's like, look at me. Like, I'm a guy who achieved all the success in life, and you can too. Oh, it's very much that. And it's like, oh, like, I, like, I'll show you. And they basically talk in a room. And Catwoman's the one that explains all this. She's like, we each went into the room. And basically, it's like, oh, well, if you could steal something, what would you steal? And she says, like, this. It's like, okay. And how would Batman capture you? And she would go, this. It's like, well, then how would you counter that? And basically, just talking them through that until, like, She's like, oh, and then I ended up being figuring out a way to steal like the all the money from the richest person in the world, mm-hmm. and and Penguin's like, oh, and I figure out like a plan to like within a day to become like the mayor and run all of Gotham behind the scenes, and Riddler's like, oh, I'll think of, like I figured out how to take control of all the electronics and everything in the city and basically lock the city down so that no one could get in, mm-hmm. uh, and. Then the Joker goes in, and the guy comes out uh, that they're talking to. It's like this guy's this guy is a mo- this guy's not what I thought. Killed them all, and they have like a big shootout, and they end up Joker kills the guy, and then that's like the start. So like as everything's going through, you have like all these pieces are like falling into part. And basically, what it ends up being is that the that guy is not dead per se, and they're using some technology to roboticize dead bodies and it turns into where oh that guy is dead and joker's thing is that like he took all of their plans so he takes control of the entire city's government infrastructure and steals all of bruce's money and that is how joker war starts we also get a lot more punchline um he also uh because punchline well punchline is created for the book yes um, I didn't read her origin story. I don't care about the character. She's fucking dumb. I don't understand why she exists as like a new Harley that's just not funny. Like she doesn't make jokes, but she's like a chemist or something. 
I just she only works as a character for Harley, which Harley is the best part of Joker War. Every part that she's in is the best part. Um, and basically, all this shit happens. Joker takes over the whole city, and he's super rich, and he has all these plans. And it's like, it basically the in all this, they he Joker ends up taking because at this point, Dick Grayson, for Billy Nightwing, has been Rick Grayson after he got shot in the head. Then he had been manipulated by the Court of Owls and thought that he grew up underneath his uh, Talon great grandfather or whatever bullshit. And then the Joker gets a hold of him and makes him Dicky Boy, and he becomes a Joker goon. Oh, Dick Boy! Uh, yes, uh, where he fights Barbara. The Barbara side of it is also fucking crazy because Joker gets a hold of her control thing for her implant to let her walk. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. And she ends up ripping it out of her body, which is how they bring Luke um, Luke Fox back, which he's now, like, not the character that he had been. Now he's, like, he's more like the Batwoman TV show character. Um, and so she ends up getting it fixed, and, like, it just becomes, like, super wonky, and it basically ends where... Um, cause I, I, I basically like heard that the Joker war is like an Adam West plot, like an Adam West Batman plot, but done in like 2020. I, it's, it's kind of no man's land E, but it's all Joker. Okay. It's like Arkham city, but Joker's running everything. And so they're stopping people. There's an introduction of a new character, which will be interesting to see how they deal with called clown killer. And it's like a little, it's like a teenager who finds a batarang, puts it into a bat, and then just starts killing uh, relentlessly Joker goons. Mm -hmm. Um, And basically it ends where Punchline is caught, and Harley basically goes to Batman, and she's like, all right, here's the deal. If you do not end this, I will end it. I will straight up kill him. And Batman's like, no, you can't. She's like, I'm telling you. And then he goes in, and they have their fight, and Joker's not going to stop, so like he's about to beat Batman, and then Harley comes in and like wrecks Joker and knocks him out cold, and Bruce, Batman's like, oh, I was just buying time for the family to come up, and she's like, I don't give a shit, and she straps a bomb to Joker and straps a bomb to herself, and she's like, I set these up that like you only have enough time to rescue one of us, and she runs to the other side of the warehouse. She's like, who are you going to save, him or me? And Batman looks and Joker's like laughing and he's like, oh, you know what you're going to do. And he's like, well, you can get yourself. I was like, yeah, I could, but I'm not going to because I want you to do it. And Batman just looks at him and then just turns and goes after Harley. And Joker like has like his heart broken Um, and he saves Harley. She wakes up in the hospital and they're like, yeah, they didn't find him, but he had taken off the bomb. And the whole thing is like, now Dick is back to being Dick, (laughs) the Nightwing. And that Joker knows that push come to shove, Batman would save somebody else over saving the Joker, I guess. Mm. And, oh, and they basically soft reboot again, like for the 800th time, Batman, now like he doesn't have his money. So Cap Catwoman gets it back and gives it to Lucius. And basically the idea is that Joker stole all his offshore accounts that he was funding, they're using to fund Batman, but now that it's all got stolen, the government knows about it, so he can't just spend it fervorously. So they can't, like, buy shit to be Batman. Um, Because he was, once again, the idea is, like, he was trying to build a better Gotham. Like, find it, like, actually have him do what everyone's like, um, you're the richest man in the world, why don't you actually put money into your city? Mm -hmm. And this destroys all of that. Oh, and part... Which is, like, kind of funny, because that's, like, kind of what's happened in Iron Man right now. Yeah. Where, like I- I- Iron Man like doesn't really have the money that he used to have, and it's like him being like uh, Bohemian. <laughs> yeah, like, they literally uh, like address it. It's like, oh, I'm Lucius is like, oh, I made you this thing. You just put it on any car, and it makes it look like a Batmobile to everybody else, even though it's not. Uh, and it's like, oh, I have like this warehouse where I can three D print Batmobiles and wet bat weapons yeah. and bat drones. It's like, yeah, you don't have access to that anymore. The other thing is that. By getting the money back, Catwoman has now made herself the number one enemy of the underworld because she stole from the underworld bank. Of course she did. 
so she's on the run, so they can't really be together anymore, which they say they're only going to be separated for a year to figure their shit out. And the only other thing that kind of happens is like, oh, like he's talking to Dick and Tim and Barbara, and it's like, oh, it's like, well, and Dick's like, oh, so does this mean we're not going to get like our allowances? And Barbara's like, what the shit? You guys get allowances? And Tim's like, yeah. And she's just like, what the hell? This is bullshit. Like, that she has. Which is like. Which is like kind of funny, but like yeah. also it's like if like if she's like Oracle, she should know that the rest get paid. Well, that's that's the other thing. She kind of retakes being Oracle during this, and and I and like part of it is in her book too, which um is a lot. Which I don't know if they ended the Batgirl book. It kind of feels like they're restarting it. It's like her trying to figure out if she wants to if she can do more good as Batgirl or as Oracle. Because Lucius or Luke Fox basically says, if something happens to your chip in your back, like it's it, that's it. Like it, we're not, we can't put it back in. Like which, like by by the way, I fucking hate that. Like like to this day, like to this day, like going back to the three Joker. Sorry, sorry to go back to this, folks. But like I hate that that the Killing Joke, which in, initially was supposed to 